that means big companies like Amazon um, are not do not run afoul of American antitrust. Why? Because they can't, you know, because they're good for consumers. They deliver things faster. They deliver things cheaper. Um, and so it's the application of a new um, of a new set of interpretations to what is still basically the same rule. Hi, this is Dr. Jed McCosco from AcademicInfluence.com and Wake Forest University. And today we have a very special guest, Professor Kathleen Thieland from MIT. So she's gonna tell us a little bit about how she got into her particular field and what it might be like to practice in political science. So go ahead, take it away, Professor Thielen. So I think mine was a somewhat circuitous path. Um, I think the way that I originally got into or got interested in politics um, may have been uh, my brother-in-law, who I come from South Dakota, and he was oh. a um, he was a, a delegate for um, George McGovern back in the day uh, when McGovern wow. was running for uh, for uh, president. Um, but I think more you know, the way that I got into comparative politics is that I did a junior year abroad, um, which oh. was extremely. Uh, important in my intellectual trajectory. I was, when I went to college, I was actually a, an English major, English literature. Um, and I hadn't mm -hmm. really thought about switching over to political science until I did uh, a junior year abroad. And it happened, and I did it in uh, Munich, Germany. Um, and it oh. happened to be, the reason I chose uh, Germany, by the way, is because uh, where I went to school and I went to high school in, in South Dakota and the only uh, foreign language that was offered was German. Um, and so this kind of narrowed my, narrowed my uh, horizons a bit. Um, but I did this junior year abroad in, uh, in Munich and it happened to be uh, an election year. Uh, and so mm -hmm. I sort of was swept up in the discussion there and in the political uh, debates. Uh, and when I came back, I switched my major from English to um, to political science. And I was very, wow. very, very strongly supported in all of my decisions uh, as a uh, as a college student. Um, I was actually one of the first in my family to uh, get a Ph.D. And I was very much encouraged to to pursue a Ph.D. by um, my undergraduate advisor, Ron Francisco, mm -hmm. um, at the University of Kansas, who was in the meantime passed away, but who was extraordinarily uh, influential in encouraging me uh, to go on a path that was not, um, that wasn't obvious um, to uh, my family, for example. <laughs> <laughs> And yet you still had that background with um, your relative being a delegate for McGovern. So you did have that. And that was while you were in high school? Okay. So you, you had a little inkling, even though you went off to University of Kansas as an English major, you still had a little bit of political inklings, huh? Yeah, I think so. It wasn't very uh, nurtured at the time, but it was certainly sort of somehow there. So tell us how you then decided on a PhD program and what did you end up doing for your PhD work? So my, this undergraduate advisor that I was just referring to, um, Professor Francisco, I didn't know really how to go about applying for graduate school or which graduate schools to uh, apply for. And so he really um, sort of took me by the hand and really walked me through that whole process. Um, mm -hmm. He was a scholar of international relations. Uh, and so that's what I thought I wanted to study at the time. And so he gave me tips on, you know, which schools would be um, would be best uh, to apply to. Um, mm -hmm. And he was uh, very influential in guiding me toward um, University of California at Berkeley, which is where I applied and where I uh, where I wound up going to to doing my Ph.D. Although there, too, I I switched um over from uh, international relations to comparative politics, and in particular, comparative political economy um, in like, mm -hmm. this first year that I was there. Um, and that's where I've basically stayed ever since. Very cool. Um, now, at your time at Berkeley, um, how did you know that you wanted to switch out of international relations and in, into comparative politics? What, what was it that triggered it? You mentioned the, the time in Munich was formative for some of that, but how did it kind of connect once you got to Berkeley? 
You know, the people who were most influential in my graduate work, um, partly it was my advisor who um, sort of opened my eyes to the world of political economy and what was interesting about political economy. Uh, but honestly, I was in a seminar um, with um, a couple of other graduate students. They were a little more advanced than I was, um, mm -hmm. but who were extremely influential. So this, this seminar, the, the, my advisor was a student of finance. So he studied business and he studied you know, financial institutions and so on. Um, but mm -hmm. all of the, or, or a couple of the sort of most uh, active members of the, of the seminar, um, who are now dear friends of mine, um, were really constantly drawing his attention back to issues of labor. Mm. And, um, hmm. and so these guys, there are really three of them in particular, who two of whom are still, you know, in the field and one of whom has left the field, but is very much working on uh, similar kinds of issues um, in a more consulting capacity. But they really influenced my trajectory by sort of uh, opening my eyes to um, the world of labor and unions. And uh, in particular, um, two of them, one of them is Swedish and the other is of Nordic uh, descent. Uh, and they were very much sort of drawing our, all of our attention uh, to the Nordic model of social democracy, which mm -hmm. I found fascinating and um, as, a, as a sort of potential model of how to have a vibrant capitalist, you know, vibrant, successful capitalist uh, um, system, which however uh, generates higher levels of uh, equality than the American version of capitalism. And so I grew interested in, you know, I continued my interest in the German case, but I also sort of extended it uh, to study the Nordics um, as well. So that mm -hmm. all of my work since then, or a lot of my work since then, has really focused on uh, labor politics, social policy, um, labor market institutions, training institutions uh, in these, the sort of Northern European realm. That's fascinating. Well, I, that's near and dear to my heart. Um, I met my Danish wife at Berkeley when I was a PhD student, and we travel a lot to Denmark, uh, Sweden, Norway, and I just love it. I just love the way that their society helps each other. Germany, too. And now if you look at what countries have done well in COVID, you know, it's that, that little bubble of those Nordic countries plus Germany that seem to have really kept watch over each other, put on the masks, did the social distancing, got through it quickly. I'm just, I'm just so jealous. <laughs> I wish oh, I was right, right. <laughs> uh, So, so what, what did your career go after Berkeley? So tell us a little bit about how that unfolded. So my first job, um, what my husband's also an academic. Um, and okay. um, uh, so we were, you know, the last year of graduate school, he studies Latin America. He studies business politics okay. in Latin America. I study labor politics in rich democracies. So as we uh, like to joke, he studies, you know, rich people in poor countries, and I study poor people in rich countries. Um, but the last year of graduate school, we put up a map on the wall of all the places that he was getting interviews and all the places that I was getting interviews. And first of all, there weren't that many, there weren't that many stick pins uh, uh, on this map to begin with. And those that were there yeah. were pretty far apart. Um, so the first job that he got was at Princeton, and the and the first job that I got was at Oberlin, which is a wonderful oh, uh, small yeah. college. Yeah, I love that school. Yeah, wonderful mm -hmm. small college in uh, in Ohio. Um, so mm -hmm. I went off to you know we drove all of our worldly possessions across the across the country, um, and I sort of got off in uh, it, at Oberlin, and he got off at um, at Princeton, and we commuted uh, for that first year. Oh. Um, and during that year, you know, we both made it clear that we had to, to both of our institutions that we needed to, um, this might not be a long-term solution or wasn't going to be a long-term solution. And so that we would have to stay on the job market. Um, and so the, that very year, I was lucky enough to get offered two jobs that were, uh, very, you know, that would have eliminated the commute. One was at Swarthmore and the other was at, at Princeton itself. And so I obviously oh, wow. took, uh, took the job at Princeton, 
Um, and so we wound up um, together. We're like the luckiest uh, academic couple. We've always been able to move um, uh, move together. So that's the only year that we had to uh, that we had to commute. Um, and wow! It wasn't. It was not that bad a commute because by mid year we basically knew that we could see the end of it. Right. That's always a reassuring feeling. <laughs> well, I'm so thankful that you guys ended up at Princeton. And and then how did you end up at MIT? Were there any uh, journeys between Princeton and MIT? There were. There were. We loved Princeton and it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. But um, Northwestern uh, offered us uh, two jobs to move um, together. And mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. so I had, uh, we had, f- I think in the 14 really glorious years also at, uh, at Northwestern. Some of mm-hmm, my mm-hmm. dearest friends uh, are still there. And it was really a, actually a pretty hard decision actually to leave Northwestern because um, the political science department there is so unique and so interesting and, and mm-hmm. so well aligned with, um, with the kind of work that I do certainly. Um, but, you know, after 14 years, MIT uh, made us again, a double offer um, and uh, it seemed like if we were gonna, it seemed like a good time to, you know, open a open, you know, turn turn the page and uh, and have a new <laughs> chapter. Um, not least because Cambridge is itself just such a, a an enormously vibrant um, intellectual <laughs> environment, and so it has been it has been wonderful as hard as it was. I, I always have a hard time leaving each of the places. I had a hard time leaving Oberlin, which I loved. Hard time leaving Princeton, which I loved. Hard time leaving um, uh, Northwestern, which I loved. Um, but Cambridge, I have to say, has been super uh, stimulating intellectually. And I work really closely um, with a couple of colleagues uh, at Harvard um, who have um, just made it a really wonderful uh, intellectual experience for me. That's fascinating. That's uh, great. And, and what year was that that you ended up in Cambridge? Uh, we moved to Cambridge in. Um, we moved to Cambridge uh, about ten years ago, twelve years ago, maybe. Okay, wonderful. So it's been a bit of a home for, home you, for you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, we do, we've definitely put down roots. So, so now let's talk a little bit more about like what you're doing right now. It's, it's. You said that it's always been sort of the Northern European and Nordic countries. It's always been a little bit about labor. Um, Tell us a little bit for those of us who are not political scientists. Like, what what is it that you do, and 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 that's of course allowed you to become one of the more influential political scientists out there, according to our uh, lists and stuff. So, what is it you do? So, there is a substantive aspect to what I do, and a, and a kind of more methodological aspect uh, to what I do. Um, the substantive aspect is to look at. Um, the development, the historical evolution of different systems of uh, economic regulation. So, how do mm-hmm. um, some of the some of the institutions that we associate with egalitar- the more egalitarian varieties of capitalism um, mm-hmm. have their roots in the late nineteenth century? And so, one of the mm-hmm. things that I've some of my I guess most influential work has been to trace the roots of um, institutions that we now very closely associate with the more social varieties of capitalism and that seem indeed to be kind of um, essential to achieving high degrees of, um, of equality, things like wage bargaining systems, things like training systems, things like uh, systems of social uh, provision, um, and tracing them back to their, to their uh, historical roots. Uh, and this is, mm-hmm. this is interesting because it turns out that um, some of the some of the institutions that we now associate with uh, with um, high levels of uh, economic equality and strong unions were actually actually have their roots in a very different kind of social coalition. Uh, so one of the more um, sort of one of the more dramatic examples of this is the German system of training, uh, which we now see as um, something that really supports um, high levels of. Uh, of, of wage equality and that offers opportunities for, um, you know, kids from uh, sort of more modest backgrounds uh, to acquire uh, skills that allow them to secure stable, well-paid, um, 
uh, employment, especially in manufacturing, but also in, in, in services. It turns out that that system has its roots in, um, you know, was not designed for this purpose. It was not designed to be helpful to labor unions. It was designed by sort of pretty reactionary artisanal uh, producers who were who were very you know ambivalent about this uh, about the the evolution of capitalism. Um, and so one of the things that I do is I sort of track uh, the evolution of these institutions. That's just one example uh, to the present uh, to the present period. And that sort of gives you a signal of the kind of methodological uh, 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 work that I'm associated with, which is um, I, I'm associated pretty strongly with a particular uh, 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 a particular view of institutions. It's it's known in the subfield as uh, historical institutionalism or comparative historical analysis. Um, and basically, the the line of argument that that or the kind of methodological contribution that I've made is to draw attention to the way in which uh, institutions, the, the important institutions that sort of structure political and political economic life, they're not just created in some big bang moments, like after you know a world war or something like that, um, but rather they evolve slowly and incrementally over long periods of time, hmm. often in ways that are, uh, that are pretty, pretty uh, paradoxical. Um, and so this is a line of argument that I've been developing both at the level of looking historically at particular institutional configurations, um, but also um, elaborating a theory of institutional change that um, looks at how institutions over time can be really reconfigured very significantly without any big uh, breakpoints. Um, and so again, the German mm -hmm. case is a nice one because uh, Germany actually experienced a whole bunch of big breakpoints uh, in the late 19th and 20th century, including you know several you know, couple, losing a couple of world wars, um, yeah. many regime changes, and so on. And so one of the things I track is some really striking continuities in some of these uh, institutions over time, while at the same time their functions and especially their political meaning. Uh, gets completely reconfigured uh, over this long span of time, uh, so that's wow. that's generally what I've been uh, what I've been thinking about for the last several decades. <laughs> so on one hand, it's the content of looking at those institutions and explaining to people how they've changed over time, and and really maybe using those as examples for us to learn from for our modern day political systems. And on the other hand, it's the methodology of how do you track an institution like this German training program as it evolves over time? So you've developed that methodology and, and shown it in some examples, and that's helped your field do, uh, other people are probably doing the same thing on different institutions, right? I mean, they, they've right. taken right. the methodology and adapt it to whatever they're particularly studying. Exactly. Very, cool. Very cool. So, 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 so what are the, go ahead, go, go ahead. ahead. Uh, what are the lessons we can learn for, from some of the institutions you've tracked? Uh, like that German training program. Is there anything that we can apply to the United States or to, to modern times? Yeah. So the, the idea is that um, you, you don't have, you can, you can add, you can add elements to old institutions in ways that can slowly over time sort of change their, change their trajectory. That's one, uh, mm -hmm. one aspect of it. Uh, another aspect of what I've been thinking about a lot is the way in which an institution that is, or a rule, institutions in political science are often sort of thought of uh, not just as sort of organizations, but also as rules. How uh, rules, the meaning and the and the political uh, uh, sort of valence of rules can be completely uh, reconfigured and co in some cases turned on its head um, through actions of say the judiciary. So um, reinterpretation of a rule um, can really change the meaning and the and the functions of that rule 100%, um, but not in ways that show up in the formal writing of the rule, right? Mm -hmm. So you can have a rule like, you know, uh, the Commerce Clause, which is designed for one particular purpose, but which over time through its reinterpretation takes on very different meaning uh, and has very different political, uh, uh, political significance over time. Um, so part of what I've been doing is trying to draw attention, uh, the attention of political scientists to arenas 
that are not necessarily at the forefront of what political scientists typically study. So a lot of what political scientists study are, you know, elections and uh, political parties and so on. But I'm arguing, actually, if you want to understand how institutions change, you have to sort of step back and pan out a bit and look at the other uh, arenas in which the meaning of rules gets renegotiated. That can be the courts, uh, and that can also be the bureaucracy, because it's uh, just the written, the formal rule um, doesn't matter as much as how it's instantiated and how it's enforced and how it's implemented uh, on the ground. And so a lot of the action uh, in politics is actually, you know, outside the realm that we typically focus on when we think about politics uh, and actually goes to these other realms that we uh, so we may even think of as, uh, you know, formally you know, politically neutral, like the bureaucracy as a as the infor the uh, the implementer of rules that are decided by politicians or the courts uh, which have this um, aura of neutrality but where hugely important uh, political decisions are are taken that can change the meaning uh, of these uh, of these rules and these institutions pretty dramatically. Hmm. Sounds so fascinating. Now, I really think it would help people like me who are not political scientists to get a specific example of something that has, has just changed a lot in the courts or in the bureaucracy and how you're bringing attention to that um, and, and how that might play out in like real life, you know, from away from the ivory tower and into, you know, what we all experience day to day. Okay. So antitrust um, is, so antitrust, what was it originally, what was the Sherman Antitrust Act, you know, originally designed to do? It was designed to sort of, uh, get rid of these big monopolistic, you know, these big firms that were developing and, and gobbling up uh, smaller competitors and taking over control of whole markets uh, in the late 19th century. The courts interpreted the Sherman Act in ways that were hugely consequential. Um, first of all, uh, it was very light on what, what, what are thought of as vertical uh, co um, combinations. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So mergers and trusts, for that matter, uh, were it was much lighter on those than it was on uh, horizontal co combinations, you know, uh, uh, sort of agreements ac among small producers. That's hugely consequential because the late 19th century, early 20th century in the United States um, experienced an enormous uh, uh, concentration of industrial power in that very period, in the very period when antitrust was, had just been had just been uh, implemented. The courts played the crucial role in that. Fast forward to the 1960s uh, and 1970s and 1980s, antitrust in the meantime has taken on a very different meaning. Um, it has taken on the meaning of um, uh, uh, so taking care of uh, sort of it is applying a consumer welfare uh, 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 standard to antitrust. That means big companies like Amazon um, are not, do not run afoul of American antitrust. Why? Because they can't, you know, because they're good for consumers. They deliver things faster. They deliver things cheaper. Um, and so it's the application of a new, um, of a new set of interpretations to what is still basically the same rule but it's all ah. about the interpretation. And so now companies like Amazon are A-OK -okay in the United States. They're not A-OK -okay in, 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 other, in other countries where similar rules are interpreted rather differently uh, by, by their judiciary. So that's just one example of uh, a set of rules that over time has remained you know, pretty, pretty uh, stable, uh, pretty static, uh, but where the interpretation has changed really pretty radically uh, over a long period of time. Well, Professor Thielen, it has been so interesting to hear about how what you do in the ivory tower can translate into what people are doing uh, in, in the real world uh, to try to change the way institutions that have been around for a long time can better serve our purposes. So we really appreciate that you take some time today to explain all of it to us. And, and uh, we really appreciate you being here. It's my pleasure. It's fun talking to you. Okay. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.